So during the process of ovulation, the secondary oocyte is released from the follicle into the peritoneal cavity. As the follicle and that ovarian wall ruptures, the secondary oocyte it is released into the peritoneal cavity. But fortunately, it does not fall into peritoneal cavity. Why? Because the fallopian tube or uterine tube is supplied with these specialized processes called fimbriae and these fimbriae they sweep on the surface of ovary at the point of that bulge or stigma and they pick up they pick up that that oocyte secondary oocyte and in this way this this oocyte it will come into what into the infundibulum infundibular part of of this uh, uterine tube or fallopian tube now it has to travel from this infundibulum into this part of uterine tube called ampulla this dilated part ampulla is the most common site of fertilization so it has to come here in order to get <clears throat> in order to get fertilized with the sperm but how it will come well on the walls of this uterine tube there are special hair like ciliary processes and with the movement of these cilia with the beating of cilia the secondary oocyte will be transported from infundibulum to ampulla of uterine tube so it will traverse through this path ultimately coming into this ampulla of uterine tube now here it will keep on waiting for its mate the sperm for a day or two right and if the sperm comes that would be a good news for it it will get fertilized it will form zygote and then it will form ultimately uh, the baby right and if sperm does not come it will keep on waiting for a day or two and then it will come forward ultimately into the uterine cavity where it will be eaten by eaten up by macrophages so this was about how secondary oocyte is transported now how the this was the of course female gamete now what about male gamete now how sperm is transported from testes up to that point ampulla of uterine tube so you know uh, by now that this uh, sperm they are formed they are synthesized into testes and where specifically in testes in the seminiferous tubules of testes in the seminiferous tubules of testes there are special cells called sertoli cells and these sperms they develop in these furrows of sertoli cells and as they mature uh, they come out of these furrow into the lumen of seminiferous tubules so after they come into the lumen of seminiferous tubules from there they gather around and they ultimately come into this part called epididymis epididymis of testes and this process is happening in both of the testes this is the that epididymis in epididymis the sperms further mature and they become motile there are certain changes that occur in sperm we will not discuss those changes in this lecture but the thing is that they the sperms they get mature in the epididymis after maturing in the epididymis they will come into ductus deferens or vas deferens and from here they will go into urethra and in urethra a special fluid called seminal fluid is added is mixed with these sperms and this fluid is contributed by secretions of three glands what are those glands one gland is seminal vesicle which contributes about 60% and then there is prostate gland and finally there is bulbo urethral gland right so secretion of secretions of these three glands they form what we call semen or seminal fluid the seminal fluid is intermixed with millions of sperms and ultimately during ejaculation these sperms along mixed with this seminal fluid it is released outside with by the help of penis passing through urethra right clear up till now now let's suppose that intercourse happens and after the intercourse semen mixed with 
semen mixed with sperms is released millions of sperms is released into the upper vagina of female right with each ejaculate about 200 to 600 million sperms are released intermixed with semen they are released into upper upper part of vagina of the female right now this you know vagina it has quite acidic environment why vagina is acidic in it is acidic in order to prevent it from germs from pathogens so vagina is acidic but these sperms they cannot tolerate acidic environment for longer now interestingly these sperms are provided with this this seminal fluid and this seminal fluid is slightly alkaline due to this alkaline seminal fluid these sperms this alkaline fluid it can buffer that acid for shortly temporarily for about 10 to 15 minutes so because of this alkaline fluid these sperms can survive here for 10 to 15 minutes but within these 10 to 15 minutes the surviving sperms must go from this point beyond into cervix and uterus and because cervix and uterus especially uh, during ovulation period they are alkaline so if they cross this acidic uh, part this acidic vagina and come into cervix they will be in the safer hands right and only one percent of sperms they are able to cross this only one percent of sperm will reach the cervix and all other sperm which do not reach the cervix in about 10 to 15 minutes they will be destroyed here right now as they reach here of course some of the seminal fluid will also come with them in the cervix one of the thing that comes with this seminal fluid one of the component of seminal fluid or semen is what is this this chemical messenger pg this pg is not parental guidance it is actually prostaglandins so special prostaglandins are secreted by a prostate gland into into the semen seminal fluid and what this prostaglandins will do is that these prostaglandins will stimulate the reverse peristalsis in in the uterine cavity now although these sperms are motile but major part uh, the major role for transport of these sperm from this point up to here and beyond too it is major part is played by reverse peristalsis so by the action of prostaglandin reverse trans uh, sorry reverse peristalsis will start right and they will reach the isthmus now randomly half of the sperm will come into the left isthmus and half of them will come into right isthmus of course half of the sperm went on the wrong way and of course they will go nowhere ultimately they will be eaten up by the female genital tract and those sperms that came into the right tract as well this i mean left fallopian tube they will also stop here both of these will stop here and they will wait for the special scent the special smell of the fragrance of this oocyte i think they can smell the presence of oocyte and of course if oocyte was not there at first place it would have been very difficult for these sperms to come in why because the cervical os would would have been closed secondly even if few sperm came here they will not go beyond and they will be ultimately dead now we are imagining a scenario in which this scandry oocyte is present here now this scandry oocyte it will release special chemical scents or what we call it chemotactic chemotactic factors or chemoattractants these chemicals they will diffuse here into this female genital tract and due to these chemotactic factors the sperm will move towards the scandry oocyte now this scandry oocyte it may be present either in right uterine tube or in left uterine tube that is totally random we have already discussed that either of the ovary each month 
can release either one of the ovary each month can release the, the dominant secondary oocyte so this time we are imagining that it it is present in the left uterine tube of course it can be in right as well so due to chemotactic factors these sperms they will move with their flagellum and they will come close to this secondary oocyte now how many sperms they are able to come at this site near the vicinity of this secondary oocyte how many sperm these are about 100 to 200 to 600 so you just imagine 200 to 600 million sperms were released and out of those millions of sperm only 200 to 600 were able to reach near the vicinity and later on we will discuss that only single sperm will fertilize this secondary oocyte you know life is full of competition and this competition starts even before you are born right now the problem here is that this secondary oocyte this princess is guarded by two layers what are those layers this yellowish layer this translucent actually it is not yellow it is just represented as yellow this translucent layer is zona pellucida it is the inner layer and outside that is the corona radiata corona radiata is made up of these cumulus cells are these cumulus cells or corona radiata cells or granulosa cells what do you think uh, we can call it either way it can be actually, they were actually once the part of cumulus oophorus actually they were granulosa cells first they were follicular cells then they turned into granulosa cells then they turned into cumulus cells and now they are corona radiata cells why i am telling you this thing this is because in books sometime you read that there is written cumulus cells sometime you read it is written corona radiata cells then other times you read that it is written granulosa cells so you guys get confused that what the what is the actual name of these cells so you can call it either way but more precisely at this point because they are forming corona radiata i should say that we must call it corona radiata cells as they are forming corona radiata so these sperms they have to first penetrate through corona radiata and then through zona pellucida to ultimately fuse with the its beloved princess oocyte secondary oocyte so how can it pass through this granulo uh, not gran <laughs> corona radiator cells of course you know they have special molecular cutters packed in the acrosome and in this at this point they can release those cutters to disperse these cells at this point the membrane of this these sperm they this is quite unstable at this point it is unstable but it is not always unstable how it is unstable that you know the normal structure of cell membrane is that it is composed it is a lipid bilayer and it, it consists of phospholipids right two layers of phospholipids with, with their hydrophobic or fatty acid tails that are arranged inside on the inner side of membrane and the polar phosphate heads they are arranged on the outer side now it consists of two types of two types of phospholipids one that are that consist of saturated fats they are straight chains and one that consist of unsaturated fats those that consist of unsaturated fats they have the, that particular bend here why there is bend because here there is double bond so at the site of double bond there is a particular bend is there i think the saturated unsaturated fats they have these their legs wide open right so don't think of other things but yes that is what it is this is their molecular structure and due to these unsaturated fatty acid due to presence of these unsaturated fatty acids due to their wide open legs they will push the neighboring one far apart right 
so you can see this is the saturated fat and this is unsaturated fat and there is another saturated fat which cannot come at this point not which cannot come very close to close to that unsaturated fat because of that wide open legs so what i want to teach here is that because of presence of these unsaturated fatty acids these membranes they have they are bit far apart from each other and they are more fluid the membranes become more fluid the membrane becomes more permeable and membrane becomes more unstable due to presence of these unsaturated fatty acids let's imagine if it only contain of course it is not the real structure it is just imagination that let's suppose if it contained only saturated fats then its structure would be much rigid these these phospholipids they would have been very closely and tightly packed with each other with with these beautiful hydrophobic interactions in between these uh, saturated fatty acid tails and then because of that the 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 cell membrane would have been much rigid much soluble uh, much stable and less permeable to ions but at this point it is due to presence of unsaturated fatty acid it is quite unstable this membrane was not always unstable initially it was very stable and let's see how and why it was made stable in the body of male in the male testes at first place let's go back <laughs> as i said it was not always unstable initially it was very stable how it was made stable that in the lumen of seminiferous tubules what happened with the membrane is that of course there were these unsaturated fatty acids but at this point in between these unsaturated and saturated fatty acids a special molecule was inserted to make the membrane stable it was bombarded with the vesicles containing cholesterol and as the cholesterol is added in between this space in between this empty space the membrane become much more stable so you must have read that cholesterol maintains the fluidity cholesterol maintains the stability of cell membrane so that is how it is doing that Uh, cholesterol is containing this hydrophobic part and very little polar part due to hydroxyl group oh group of course i will not describe the structure of cholesterol but cholesterol what it does is that it keeps the membrane from either becoming very stable very rigid and it also keeps the membrane from becoming very unstable so it maintains the fluidity it maintains the stability so what happens that initially the when they were formed when they were synthesized the sperms when they were synthesized in the seminiferous tubules their membrane were made quite stable why their membranes were made stable because they should not release the acrosomal content early on this acrosome these tools these weapons they are very important for them and if they lost these weapons early on that what we call precocious acrosomal reaction if that happens this sperm will become useless and that could lead to subfertility right so that is why cholesterol is added into and later on as it is mixed with the semen later on as it is mixed with the semen the seminal glycoproteins are also lying on the on the top on the head of these sperm right and these are special inhibitory factors as well in these glycoproteins these are special inhibitory factors which again prevents the early on precocious acrosomal reaction i just can't stop me from admiring the beauty of nature that how beautifully the system has been made that first the membrane was stabilized by adding cholesterol and then on the top of that special inhibitory factors were added 
to so as to prevent the precocious acrosomal reaction but what it means is that as it comes into the female genital tract these things must be removed what are these things the glycoproteins inhibitory factors must be removed as well as this cholesterol must be removed in order to make this sperm capable of undergoing acrosomal reaction so first of all these seminal glycoproteins will be washed out in the female genital tract not in the male tract they will be released into female body into the vagina and as it passes as the sperms as the sperm passes through uterus and fallopian tube two things mainly will happen what are those two things first of all the seminal glycoproteins will be removed and to make the membrane stable what else should be removed yes these cholesterol molecules yeah cholesterol molecules are also removed in order to make the membrane unstable how they are removed you know estrogen it causes secretion of very special molecules into the uterus one of the molecule is hdl high density lipoprotein and the other molecule is albumin of course there are some other substances as well some enzymes sterol sulfatase and some other enzymes as well the role of these enzymes is not yet clearly elucidated so i will refrain from mentioning the details here but two important things two important things two important cholesterol acceptors are hdl and albumin that are released into this uterine cavity and fallopian tubes lumen as well so what they will do is that they will pick up the cholesterol this is called efflux of cholesterol from sperm membrane sperm's membrane so both of them both of these things they will pick up the cholesterol and they will be absorbed into female's body now here an interesting point is that although estrogen is a sex related hormone but you must have heard that estrogen is good for heart good for cardiac health why it is good for cardiac health because estrogen increases the hdl levels you know about hdl that it is good fat and it increases the estrogen increases the hdl level in not only in uterine cavity but also in blood as well so actually estrogen increases the hdl for the sex activity for for in improving the chances of undergoing fertilization but by doing so it also helped in improving the cardiovascular health so that is why what they say is that females are less prone to develop cardiovascular problems especially during fertile period and but later on in the post menopausal period the risk of developing cardiovascular diseases is equal in male as well as females so let's move forward so up till now the sperm's plasma membrane has become unstable and you know by now how now as it becomes unstable another important thing that happens is that its membrane become more permeable for different ions especially calcium and bicarbonate actually the these calcium and bicarbonate ions there are special ion channels for these ions as well but these the permeability even through these ion channels were previously reduced by the presence of these glycoproteins and by the by the presence of that stable membrane but now at this point it will become more permeable for calcium as well as bicarbonate ion this calcium and bicarbonate ion through a complex pathway mediated by adenylyl cyclase we will not discuss the details cyclic amp mediated pathway through that pathway this calcium and bicarbonate it will do two thing it will make this uh, this uh, sperm hypermotile it will increase the motility of this sperm it will turn this sperm into hyperactive sperm furthermore this calcium and bicarbonate ion it can cause release of acrosomal content that is acrosomal reaction we will discuss how it happens in the next lecture 
Now here is another point that in IVF how the capacitation occurs. Of course during IVF the sperms they are not sent into the female uterine cavity or female fallopian tube so how they can undergo the process of capacitation and remember without capacitation the sperm cannot fertilize what they do is that they put the sperm into a special medium into a special defined medium and in that medium there are cholesterol scavengers or cholesterol acceptors are there and again just like what happens in the nature they also causes the efflux of cholesterol they pick up the cholesterol they remove the cholesterol from from this membrane of sperm so here as i have told you that bicarbonate and calcium it is very important these ions are very important for causing the acrosomal reaction as well as causing the motility of sperm now you know what is the nature of bicarbonate ion is it alkaline or acidic alkaline yes bicarbonate is the alkali reserve of our body so it needs bicarbonate sperm needs bicarbonate for for proper functioning in other words you can say that sperm needs alkaline environment for its functioning for its movement for its survival and that is why it cannot tolerate the acidic environment that is one of the reason that it cannot tolerate acidic environment and it can live happily it can move happily wander happily in the alkaline environment of uterus and fallopian tube right so this is what we call capacitation so what is capacitation capacitation consists of series of functional and bio biochemical modifications in the spermatozoa that renders it capable of fertilizing the oocyte what are these mod modifications these are functional and biochemical modifications they are non morphological modifications if you see a sperm a capacitated sperm and if you look a sperm that is not capacitated they will look the same apparently morphologically their shape will be same there is no change in the shape the only change is functional and biochemical and you know what are those changes of course there is removal of glycoproteins there is cholesterol efflux removal of cholesterol from uh, from the membrane turning the membrane unstable and capable of undergoing acrosomal reaction and membrane becomes because of these two things membrane becomes more permeable to ions especially calcium and bicarbonate ions and also this capacitation process it turns the sperm into hyperactive sperms hypermotile so these are these hyperactive capacitated sperms compare them with that slow lazy uncapacitated sperms they are moving quickly fastly and with that drill machine like action they can pass through corona radiata cells after releasing the that that acrosomal contents we will we will discuss that in next lecture and remember without capacitation an uncapacitated sperm it is not able to undergo it it is not capable of fertilizing the oocyte it gets the capacity of fertilizing the oocyte and that is why because it gets the capacity to fertilize oocyte that is why we call it capacitation of sperm so this was about transport of gametes and capacitation in next lecture we will discuss what is acrosomal reaction and what happens beyond that point thank you so much for watching this video